Today we have the privilege of sitting down with one of my favorite interview subjects in the Swiss watch industry, a man named Jean-Claude Biver. He's a legend. In 1982, he started Blancpain and was instrumental in the revival of mechanical watchmaking. He then moved to Omega, where he put Omega on the wrist of James Bond and on Sidney Crawford. And since 2004, he's been guiding a brand named Hublot to strength to strength. Now he's the chief of all of LVMH Group's watches, and he's overseeing Hublot, Tag Heuer, and Zenith. And today we get to sit down with him and learn his philosophy and his ambition and his plan for each of these. So come with me. At Basel Fair this year, you talked about how value is so incredibly important for watches today. Please explain that to us. It was not always like that. When uh, I developed the first tourbillon in 1984 uh, for Blancpain, with Blancpain, or the first minute repeater in 85, we were worried to achieve it. We were not worried how much it would cost. <laughs> That has dramatically changed because we are no more in 85, we are in 2016. So we are 30 years later. 30 years later, there have been so many minute repeaters, and not a lot, but nevertheless, at least 100 a year on the market, so many tourbillons, that today the problem is not how can I make a tourbillon, it's how can I make it that the perceived value is twice the price. This is a new mentality. This is a new way to think. So people are looking now for value, value, value. And that is why I said Tag Heuer, for instance, you, you refer to Tag Heuer. I said we have from now on three commands, three commands, three, only three to follow. Number one, we must be avant-garde because you say in the logo Swiss avant-garde since 1860. If it's Swiss avant-garde since 1860, it has to be avant-garde in 2016 too. Number two, we must be the accessible luxury watch brand of Switzerland. And number three, perceived value at least double. If one of these three commands are not present in the product development, I refuse the product. I say, come back. Yes, but Mr. Beaver, we cannot do a tourbillon under 45,000 Swiss francs. I said, okay, then we don't do. Yes, but we need one. Then go back and study. And now starts the study. If from beginning on you have a limit, which is the price, and not the limit to achieve it, to achieve to make a tourbillon, no, that's not interesting. I want the price. You are going to design the movement in a totally different way. For instance, if a watchmaker has to assemble this and this, and you have this little part here, you know, what does it do? It makes it possible that when he is not in the center, that you can see, and then you push, and then, ah, now it fits. So I said, Let's build the movement like this. You have always a little mark here so that the watchmaker has not to adjust and then take it back and, and spend half an hour and then again try. No, it must click. And that was the start of the whole story. And suddenly we said, no. We can sell at 15,000? You're joking. But goddamn, it looks like it would cost 50,000. That's what we want. And that's what, that, that's what we did. And we produce 1,000 pieces this year. <laughs> and and uh, uh, so, somehow we are the leader. <laughs> we are the leader of tourbillons with the Swiss certification. Nobody produces more tourbillons than we. So we have become in a few months, number one in the world of Switzerland for producing tourbillons with the COSC certification. So Mr. Beaver, when you launched this incredible tourbillon chronograph at Basel Fair at 15,000 Swiss francs, and immediately there was a response from Thierry Stern of Patek Philippe saying that Mr. Beaver, your tourbillon is too cheap. How did that make you feel? <laughs> 
I said, God damn, I will have to spend again a few million on my favorite brand to honor him and to say thank you very much. Because if the Pope, if the reference, if the king tells you, listen, Mr. Beaver, this watch is much far too cheap. You could have sold it three times more. Then I have achieved it. And I said, not only will I have to buy a lot of Patek to say thank you, but maybe I should retire. I have achieved the biggest compliment that I ever got in my lifetime. So, Mr. Beaver, one of the greatest achievements of Hublot is the idea of relevance. Relevance to the contemporary world, relevance to the contemporary consumer, using football, using music, using fashion models like Bar Raffaelli, using style icons like Lapo Elkin. Explain to me why it's so important to be relevant to the consumer of today. I always say to the people in these brands, guys, we have a king and a queen. And that's all what we have to do is to serve both. I agree. First, start with the king. Who is the king of Hublot? Stupid, immediate answer, the customer. So, we have one guy to serve, it's the king. And the king, that's all we have to concentrate on which means we have to concentrate on the customer. If you want to serve a customer, you must know his history. Uh, where does he come from? How was he educated? What does he like? What does he hate? What is his religion? What is his passion? What is his hobby? Uh, you have, what is his character? How, how, how wealthy is he? How generous is he? All this we have to know. The more we know, the better we can serve. The queen is the product. We have a king, the customer. We have a queen, the product. And the queen, we must make the queen so beautiful, so sexy, so nice, so balanced, so equilibrated, uh, so generous, that when she meets the king, they fall in love. But where do they meet? Ah, for the meeting, we organize some festivals. Hublot has a king who loves polo, who loves cricket, who loves sailing, who loves football, who loves Formula One, who loves music, who loves Coachella, who loves to have tattoo. So, are we going to do that? Of course, if the king likes it. We are going to, to, to follow. And where is the king going? Ah, the king is going to holidays, to Stade, he's going to Saint-Tropez, he's going to saint Barth, he's going to Cochrane. Ah, okay, then we will go to Saint-Tropez, to saint Barth, and we follow. And what does the king like? Some king, they like ladies that are tall, some others because he is not so tall, he wants a lady that is the same size as he. Yeah, some others say, ah, I don't like if she's dressed too much sexy, I want her to be very uh, uh, soft. So we're going to adapt to the taste of our kid. And that's it. It's not more difficult than this. So it's interesting that now that China has slowed down a little bit, it seems as if all the luxury watch brands have all fled to focus on America. Now this strikes me as offering maybe an opportunity for an intelligent brand like Hublot. What do you think? You know, China it must not be underestimated. For instance, what about the middle class in China? The middle class in China is maybe 10% of the population, even not. Wait till it's 50% of the population. 50% of 1.4 billion, that's a hell of a lot of people. And the government has no other choice than to grow the middle class. You cannot just grow the, 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 the top rich. It's important to have them because the money can only come from the top and go down. So you need this. But at, at a certain moment, what is growing is the middle class. So we must know 
that this middle class will grow. We must trust also the Chinese government to do the right, uh, to take the right options to bring this middle class up. Because if they don't succeed, there will be a revolution there. So they have to. So China is just in stone age for the Swiss watch industry. <laughs> now for the moment, there is a stabilization or consolidation because also some watches were bought for the wrong reasons. But once this is cleaned, it will start again. And China is by far, far not to be underestimated. You know, five years ago, everybody went to China and nobody cared about America. Now, because we have a problem in China, everybody goes to America and everybody forgets China. It's totally, it's a nonsense. And we are not doing this. It's the biggest opportunity. This is why we are investing so much. We are investing like never before in China. Number one, it's an opportunity. And number two, what is happening now? As everybody takes the money out of China and goes and put it in America, where our voice is becoming much louder. We pay less and we have more voice. <laughs> so it's the best way to invest. And that's what we're doing.